Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Europa Universalis Rome for tutorials. I'm your lovely host, Galvin, and today we're going to be diving in and looking at one of the most complicated pieces of machinery in the game, the Senate. Now, let's go to political map mode. We've dived in as Rome, and here we will click on the government tab labeled SPQR. Alright, so the Senate, you see multiple things here on this tab. First, the consul, otherwise your leader. This title does change depending on your culture. Who the next consul will be, the censors, and the factions, as well as a visual indication. Now, a lot of these titles will change throughout. For example, a Greek leader would be called Archon, just as an example. There's also, of course, the title of king, but we'll be getting into monarchies in a different video. Now, to start things off, luckily, our factions are balanced. 20, 20, 20, 20, and 19. Let's go through the few factions that we have here. The first one's the military faction. Now, depending on what faction's in power, you get certain bonuses. In the case of a military faction being in power, morale of armies and land organization. Not bad for when at war. Mercantilists get trade income and diplomacy success. Diplomacy success is actually very important because it allows you to establish trade routes without people liking you. It's actually extremely useful. Uh, do not necessarily neglect this as something that could be hard, because, well, if you need civilization from trade routes, you know, getting into uh, Rome's pants, mercantile faction is good for that. Mm. The religious faction, stability cost, whoop, stability cost modifier, and omen success chance. Very useful for when you have to invoke those uh, unfavorable omens. Civic which is build cost, build time, and national tax. This is good for periods of peace when, well, you're going to be building a lot of buildings, but not doing much fighting. And finally, the populists. Well, let's just start with the populist faction. Obviously, they're not exactly great, as they give you national revolt risk and increase your stability cost, neither of which are particularly good. Now, each faction has a set of multiple... No, oof. Set, let me try that again. A set of... Influencers. I don't know why I want to say multipliers, but that is not the right word. Oof. A set of influencers. Here we can see those influencing on the military faction. For example, having claims on foreign provinces grants the military faction a great boost in political attraction. Political attraction is basically saying how much of the Senate they should make up, roughly. Obviously, it won't add up to 100, but it's okay. Unfortunately, the populist faction currently is 51%, but we'll cover that in a bit. Now, political attraction is based on a number of factors. The most obvious one is the various people who are part of the faction and appointed to offices. Uh, this affects all factions very equally, and it's entirely dependent on their charisma, one of the three stats that each person has. So, you know, having a censor with extremely high charisma improves the political attraction of the military faction by 6%. And in particular, there are special ones. For example, the military has claims on foreign provinces, huge army, mercantile faction has active trade routes, um, and some other ones. A uh, huge navy, I believe, is another one. Religious faction has omen invoked, which, just to show you, let's just invoke something randomly. Well, we failed. Having a bad omen invoked actually doesn't affect the religious faction at all. You have a omen invoked, it'll be good. I have to let a month pass. But yeah. And the civic faction, having a lack of slaves, having lots of buildings constructed. And of course, the people appointed to the offices. Very good stuff there. And finally, the unfortunate populist faction. Now, the populist faction is actually a measure of how terrible you're running your country. <laughs> as odd as that is, its populist faction gets big. It's basically the game's way of kicking you in the nuts and telling you to get better, scrub. <sighs> so what we have here right now is the populist faction is incredibly attractive for a few reasons. The first one, they ha that we have unused trade routes. If you aren't efficiently using all of your province's trade routes, well, unfortunately, you're going to uh, get kicked in the balls. You do not want... Under any circumstances, the populists to come to power. Okay, there's very limited set of circumstances. I'll get to those. But for the most part, you really do not want the populists to come to power. Not only do they have these negative effects, every time a populist comes to power, it will randomly change one of your ideas. They are hell to go to power. 
Ugh, you do not want them. So you need to do everything in your power to keep them. In addition, there's one other factor of the populace I haven't mentioned. Let's try and declare war on Carthage. In order to do this, we need permission from the Senate. Now, let's see who's in favor of the Senate. The military faction? Completely in favor. Mercantile faction? Completely in favor. Religious faction? Completely in favor. Civic faction? Completely in favor. Populist faction? 0% in favor. Now, you could literally give gold. Like, you could ask the Senate permission to give gold to the populist faction leader, and the populist faction would block it. They are the modern-day Republicans from the U.S. House of Representatives. They are obstructionists to no regard. They do not care about your government and will block everything you try and do. This can be extremely troublesome. If they get 51% in the Senate, you are extremely hard-pressed to be able to take any action. And it really tells you you need to reevaluate quickly and fix your problems. It is not time for expansion. In addition to all of this, of course, there are other things. Say this leader. Actually, we, he, the populace have a pretty bad leader. Um, he's only 16%. But one of the ways that you can attempt to control the populists in prison... Hey, all the better. He took his own life. I'm cool with that. He didn't want to be imprisoned. It's cool by, fine by me. And by doing that, you can appoint, basically force the appointment of a new populist faction leader. I've had... Oh god, this guy's terrible. Oh god, what have I done? Don't do it to 16 percenters. That's actually a really good thing to have. In particular, you'll... Uh, if I've had populists... I've had populist faction leaders who were well into the 30% for support just from being extremely charismatic. And sometimes, the best way to handle those is to simply have them execute it. Or imprisoned and have them take their own life. Either works. Of course, for that, you do incur the tyranny, but... Eh? It'll, it'll be okay, I'm sure. It's a lot better than having the populists come to power, let's face it. So... In addition to this, you can also, of course, appoint various offices. If I want the civic faction to come to power... Wow, I don't have anyone in the civic faction. Alright, civic and religious. If I just want to get rid of the military and the mercantilist faction, I can, of course, appoint new censors. Omen's been invoked. The religious faction's happy. They are praetor as well. And otherwise, beyond the massive unused traders that I have, the populist faction is slowly going to grow weaker over time. If I fix my trade route problem. In addition, of course, you can also appoint your various ministers here. They of they affect this. And uh, trying to balance your senate. You need to try and work to whatever faction you need in power. As each of these laws, which I'll be discussing shortly, involve certain things. For example, let's have a look at this law. Ruler. One of the following must be true. Populist or religious faction in order to pass this law. So if you need a particular law passed... Well, you're going to have to suck up to a particular faction. One faction isn't necessarily inherently superior over one another, but they all have their time and place. I mean, the military faction's unbeatable when you're at war. Better morale of armies, better land organizers, just going to make you kick the enemy's ass. Hell, if you, it, it's hard to, you know, say that one fa guy having a military faction leader and another not. It could, you know, very easily be the difference in winning a war. This is a huge bonus, but that's the problem. They're all huge bonuses, but they're all slightly beyond your control, and you have to play a very fine game. And now, let's get on to the laws. First things first, I'm going to have to offer a sacrifice. Boot. Alright, back to government. So we now have four laws that we can pass. Most of these laws, minus a couple... Uh, will require us to lose one stability to pass them, which does suck, but it is what it is. One of my personal favorite laws is minus 10% omen power, plus 10% omen success chance. Oh, even if your omens are weaker, you can work your way up and get close to 100% omen success chance, and I think that's probably one of the best things you could hope to do. So, work at it. And some of them don't actually uh, require you to have positive stability, but some do, and... All laws have a opposing law. So by having... Well, actually, I think this one may... Yeah, it does. Totally does. Lex alia lefufa. 
Kufia. I have no idea which one uh, the opposing law would be. It's one of them. But obviously you can't have two opposing laws passed at any point in time. And many laws... Hey, here's the opposing law. Does not have the law Lex Elia et Fufia. So you can't pass this law as long as this law is passed. You can, of course, revoke laws. It will only cost you one stability. But generally speaking, the faction that, you know, requests you to pass it uh, will be different. So while this may require a civic faction to pass... Oh no, it actually still requires me to be in the civic faction to revoke it. Others will require you to be in different factions. Now, there are also, of course, some that have not obvious trade-offs because some numbers are green. While this does grant you additional tax modifier, it also changes your freemen into citizens faster. And, as I'll explain in a different video, this uh, can be a trade-off. And it depends on what you need right now. This could be a very good law or a very bad law. Now, while you can revoke it, it does cost stability, and stability can often cost a lot of money. So you need to be careful about what laws you pass, and you need to think ahead. Am I going to need this law for 10 years? Am I going to need this law for 50 years? Am I just going to need this law to the end of time? And uh, be very careful about how you do that. And uh, that's about it on the Senate. You uh, should now have a basic idea of how to manipulate it. Unfortunately, it's not exactly easy to... Uh, pick your next consul. When in doubt, it's always possible you could try and imprison him, if you really don't like it. I've uh, had to imprison a few populist uh, guys before they came to power before, but... Wow! I mean, my guys might just be incompetent at capturing him, but everyone's taking their own life. Fine by me. So, that of course means... That, uh, we won't have the civic faction coming to power, we'll have the military faction coming to power next. Of course, things are to change, as the number of friendly senators can vary entirely based on their faction. Yeah. So you need to control your senate. Your senate is your power. And whatever the fuck you do, don't let the populists come to power. You won't like it. And with that, thank you everybody for watching. As always, this has been your lovely host, Calvin, signing off.